topic of the day is about China Central Television, and I'll try to uh, you know squeeze you know a little bit of everything about China Central Television within the next 40 or 45, uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, so I give it a fancy title. It, it's called Unpack uh, China Central Television. So, so the, the qu first question is, so what, what is China Central Television? Well, CCTV is a, a state-owned and controlled commercial broadcaster that, that is financially self-reliant, operationally autonomous, and yet politically dependent. It operates 24 channels and expanding continuously, and with its comprehensive channel CCTV1 uh, being carried mandatorily by all TV stations. So CCTV has the market dominance in China. So now to unpack CCTV's market dominance, one must understand uh, China's television structure itself, how uh, television uh, works overall. Now, China has the so-called four-tier TV structure, where TV stations are set up at the national, provincial, uh, city, and county levels. And both national and local regulators operate their own TV stations and serve audiences within their own administrative boundaries. Right? And as a consequence, television stations, broadcasting bureaus, and governments at the same administrative levels closely linked are closely linked in uh, economic and political exchange. And TV stations depend on national and local government. Uh, and, and broadcasting bureaus' policy protections to monopolize regional markets. And meanwhile, the government and the bureaus rely on TV stations to propound their political influence and also to generate revenues, to bring them money, right? So that they can get you know, bonuses and so on, right? And the state agency that administers CCTV is soft. The state administration of radio, film, and TV, I think it you know, recently consolidated with a, a, another, a cluster of other agency now has an even fancier name, which you know, I can't remember at the moment, pardon me. Now, so because of that, the economic interest of soft is uh, intricately linked to the financial well-being of CCTV, which uh, connects politics directly with commerce. Right, uh, a characteristic uh, that is ripened with corruption. Now, it is worth noting that Chinese television, including CCTV, used to be funded entirely by the state. CCTV was established in 1978 by taking over the formerly Beijing television, China's first TV station, which was funded in 1958, right, the year China launched its Great Leap Forward. And the funding of CCTV coincided in 1978 with China's official launch of its economic reform policies. And obviously, the, disa uh, the disastrous Cultural Revolution ended only two years before. And as it waned from state subsidy, CCTV was able to return a percentage of its annual revenue uh, to the state. So you, we, here we just very briefly witnessed this kind of a, a, a decentralization and privatization here. Uh, and then TT, uh, TV stations have since become important revenue generating enterprises to local government and broadcasting bureaus from CCTV all the way down to local stations, right? Privatization, not privatization, but commercialization uh, has been the trend. And soft that does is financially linked to CCTV and it is motivated therefore both politically and economically to boost CCTV's market share. So the financial and political establishments have converged in their common interest or pursuit of prosperity and stability, right, essentially to maintain CCTV's domestic monopoly and market dominance. So how to sustain CCTV's monopoly? Now, there's a must-carry policy, and there's an exclusive information granting, and later on there's also uh, uh, at various times a crackdown on local uh, programs. Now, for CCTV to maintain its national monopoly, local cooperation <coughs> remains the key. Uh, Soft emphasized again and again that guarantee, guaranteeing CCTV's national coverage is political mission, an undeniable obligation and responsibility of local broadcasting bureaus and television stations. So it's a must 
you must do it, right? And as the financial stakes become high, and many local stations defied soft's unfair policies, and to crack down on local rebellion, and campaign was launched as early as in 1996 by the state to re-centralize what it saw as a chaotic and disordered landscape of Chinese television. And it ordered the closing down of unapproved TV outlets and, uh, and across the country. And following this, it merged county-level TV uh, local stations and tightened the control over program uh, sources, requesting that county TV stations allocate most of their airtime to transmit central and provincial TV stations programs, essentially guaranteeing more uh, airtime for CCTV's program. And in terms of exclusive information, CCTV is granted exclusive coverage rights to major national and international events. And the CCP regularly leaks exclusive information to CCTV, making it the go-to source for insight on the party. In addition, CCTV has exclusive coverage rights to national and international sports events, which are you know, very, very lucrative, obviously, including the Olympics and the World Cup, right, and which brings in huge profits to the network and, of course, to SAFT itself. And then there's uh, at various times a crackdown on local dialect programs. Now, so how does local stations react? Are they just going to sit back and say, OK, well, they actually are resistant. They fight back. And the arrival of satellite television has challenged the CCTV's dominance and enabled the local stations to, to fight back in, you know, using various means. Now, each provincial station, in theory, is allowed to operate one satellite TV channel with signal coverage capable of reaching the entire uh, nation technically. But because of the administrative boundaries we talked about, right, the four-tier structure and also local protectionism, each provincial TV station has to negotiate with other uh, <laughs> provinces to bring its satellite channel to their local cable ne uh, networks. So for instance, if Sichuan uh, Satellite TV says, I want to have a you know, real uh, uh, nationwide coverage. So, and can I, or can I actually, you know, at least uh, beam some uh, uh, program signals to, to you, to Yunnan, and Yunnan say, okay, let's do that. Why don't we swap? So this is how it started uh, initially. So the local stations do uh, try to consolidate and, and, and fight back, push back a little bit. And so um, most the provincial state uh, uh, broadcasters uh, have managed to extend their regional uh, reach via this independent satellite and the cable distribution deals with other provincial broadcasters. And then uh, there are two TV stations that emerged, uh, right now actually as we speak, there are more and more, but two uh, local stations have emerged as the, the biggest challenges to CCTV. One is the Phoenix TV, the Hong Kong based Phoenix TV, uh, which was launched on, uh, in 19, uh, 1996 as a joint venture between satellite television Asian region, a uh, subsidiary of Star Group Limited, which is itself a subsidiary of Murdoch's News Corporation, and also a, a, a local Liu Changre, a well-connected Chinese businessman. And Phoenix, what kind of program does it Phoenix do? Well, Phoenix initially made its name for uh, infotainment programs that featured a mixture of political and economic news. Uh, current affairs shows and talk shows, a little bit of film and music reviews, uh, movies and TV dramas, and, and from all over Asia, right? It does uh, uh, import uh, various programs from uh, neighboring Asia countries. And over the years, Phoenix has carefully cultivated a very cozy relationship with the Chinese government. And therefore, in January uh, 2003, that was 10 years ago, SAFT granted the lending rights to Phoenix Info News Channel and making it one of the few non-state television broadcasters in mainland China, uh, which is capable, able to broadcast information about events not covered by the state media, in theory. Right? And, and because Phoenix TV is based in Hong Kong, uh, it has a little more leeway in producing uh, more diverse alternative programs. You know, the programs are a little more liberal uh, in its, uh, its content. And coming from Hong Kong, it has certain cachet, you know, carries a certain chic and so on. So it captured 
uh, you know, certain segment of audiences, so the elite audiences, uh, including uh, the CCP's officials. And I, the joke has it that if you go to Zhonglanhai, you know where Zhonglanhai is, like the, the central government's compound, you know, all the TV stations are not turned to CCTV but to Phoenix TV. Because they know what CCTV says, they're just are curious to know, you know, what Phoenix can bring in about how the world perceives China. But, but of course, Phoenix mean, itself is filtered, you know, the, the perception of that is, is filtered. So, so Phoenix uh, has eroded uh, CCTV's elite audiences, and then there is the you know notorious Hunan satellite TV. I guess you all know the Supergirl. Uh, fiasco there. So, and Hunan Satellite Television has become known as the maven of popular entertainment programs. Hunan TV's Supergirls, a youth-oriented singing competition show coupled with mobile voting novelty a few years back became an overnight rating sensation. Uh, I think that was in uh, 2004, 2005, something like that. It's yeah, almost 10 years, very fast, eight or nine years, yeah. Uh, so it's overnight sensation, eroding CCTV's different segment for audiences, you know, these youth uh, um, kind of low-end audiences. And the network CCTV promptly denounced the, uh, the Supergirls, the show as a rogue program produced by the rogue broadcaster. Hi. Uh, how many of you have seen, have followed this episode? <laughs> Clay, yeah. Come on, don't tell me you've never watched those, those young people here. You don't know Supergirls? Really? <laughs> well, that makes me feel really old. Um, so feeling the heat for becoming increasingly irrelevant to the youth, it was mandated to reach and unify. CCTV launched a campaign, a series of campaign, in fact, as reflected in this uh, slide, to undermine influence of popular program from the local stations. Right. And as CCTV condemned Supergirls, it aggressively launched its own talent quest show, uh, Dream China. How many of you know Dream China? And nobody watches CCTV either. Yeah, I'll tell you, cause if I have time later on, oh, I might just tell you now, because I, I, I gave a talk yesterday um, in San Francisco. Uh, so we talked about, uh, it, it's, a, it's a topic about film, so we talk about quota that the Chinese government, uh, 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 you know, demand uh, or mandate, you know, you, you can only allow 25 and 20 you know, big blockbuster films coming to China each year. Uh, so uh, after my talk, uh, audience uh, very eagerly raised their hand and asked, uh, does the US government have quota for Chinese films? <laughs> Do we need quota for Chinese films? Where are the Chinese films? Where are the audiences? But OK, now, um, so, so CCTV launched uh, Dream China in 2005 and entrusted Li Yong. CCTV is king of pop culture as its host. How many of you know, you know Li Yong? Good. Well, at least, uh, you know, he's famous. Uh, but, but Dream China, together with CCTV's several other attempts at popular entertainment programs, generated little enthusiasm. People still flock to see all these reality shows. Uh, you know, those, those beautiful uh, young women and, and you know, uh, young guys and on Hunan TV. So now competition from the local stations, uh, competition does bring uh, in program innovation and liberalization and does, you know, to a certain extent, uh, help to dismantle CCTV's uh, monopoly, but it also uh, propels a race to the bottom mentality where ratings become the only indicator of success and programs of popular taste ring supreme, right? And during the course of my research in writing that book, I met many seasoned CCTV practitioners who saw their pr uh, professional standards compromised in the rush to produce programs of popular uh, appeal. Yeah, people come to me and people complain and whine. Now, overall, competition challenges CCTV's monopoly, which some see as a good thing that helps to, helps to push for a more open Chinese media sphere. The popular news anchor Bai Yin Song for one emphasized that the market mechanism has been a positive uh, counterforce to state control. How many of you know Bai Yin Song? He is very well known. He's in a, a real heavyweight uh, news program, newscaster. 
and commercialization, as he sees it, is a liberating force for Chinese media. I'm quoting him in lengthy here. He says, it is better than responding to the political pressure alone. The injection of market force uh, should be viewed as a progress. The market force the market forces us to respond to the needs of the public. And when the media rely more on advertising and other forms of commercial income instead of government funding, they respond more to audiences and thus the public. So it's a very interesting logic here. Very interesting, unquote. So the next question is, what is the mechanism for which China's censors control what goes out on CCTV? Which department is responsible and how do they maintain control? Right? Are these sensors on site within the CCTV newsroom? So, so who, who does watch program and, and you know, decide this is on, this is out, right? Now, so we'll talk about the supervision of CCTV. Now, the supervision of CCTV falls on the propaganda ministry and both the propaganda ministry and SAFT. The central government oversees the CCTV via two interlocking systems. There is the ideological system of parties propaganda department, which provides mostly guidelines and thought directives, right? And then, then there's the administrative system of the state administration of radio, film, and television, which performs the actual daily oversight, including censorship of sensitive uh, content. And day-to-day -day supervision of CCTV obviously falls on soft. Uh, which coordinates and evaluates the uh, network's key propaganda efforts, key propaganda campaigns, uh, regulates its signal coverage, controls its senior appointments, and decides on its organizational structure and all, all of its programming. And within CCTV, uh, its internal leadership is comprised of a party committee and a senior management uh, team. The former is responsible for ideological control and the later uh, the station's daily operation. And the membership of these two groups closely overlap, though the party committee ultimately trumpets the management team, which is typical of the organizational structure of any Chinese state-run company. Right. So let's talk about, you know, everybody, we mentioned Chinese media, the question of censorship always comes out. So what about censorship? So what, what, what is the kind of general trend uh, when we speak of uh, censorship in China uh, these days? Well, the, the general trend has been from a very strict censorship to self-censorship. You know, the state tries to down, downgrade the responsibility or downshift the responsibility to, to the local minders, right, to the middle-level bureaucrats and to journalists themselves. Uh, now, so, but top-down censorship used to be the norm. Regulatory policies and, and ideological guidelines were routinely handed down from the propaganda department. Party leaders' speeches and reading comments can override any statutes, laws, and normative documents. If there are any actually laws and statutes, they are in practice. You know, anybody, leaders, uh, a, a comment can override these. And as the party becomes more sophisticated in its uh, in its uh, public relations effort, it has loosened its firm grip and self-censorship by media professionals has become, you know, the principal mode of control. Uh, contradictory policies and frequent political swings have contributed to this kind of on-the-job training of a new generation of media professionals who are thoroughly invested in this fine art of intuiting what is permissible. So it's a fine line, you know, what can be said, you know what cannot be said. If programs deviate from the social, uh, socialist core, the producer will be fired, obviously, and the party official in charge of approving the program would also be fired. So, so we're talking about bread and butter issues. So the system does encourage self-censorship, and producers and middle-level ma ma managers are even more cautious than the state regulators in determining what could and could not be put on air. So airing on the safe side or self-censorship has become the kind of a norm among Chinese media professionals. professionals. But make no mistake, though, that despite deregulation, the Chinese party state still filters media content by censorship. And compulsory censorship has been imposed so that all programs must get approval before and after broadcasting. And I, as I, I was told, it only in, Jan, uh, in July, when I was in Shanghai talking to a couple of uh, uh, TV personalities, they told me you know, how uh, the, the final cuts have to be sealed before being rushed for broadcasting. If the seal is broken, 
that means somebody has altered the content and the, con the, the tape will be sent back. So, and, and it's, a, it's a serious you know, business delivering <coughs> that sealed tape, right? And so the party has tightened its control over news materials uh, recently if it followed uh, Chinese politics, right? And a party memo uh, secretly issued by the general office of the CCP Central Committee uh, this April, which came to light uh, only in August, uh, the so-called document number nine, re-emphasized the importance of ideological control. Right? So the control is still there. Now, despite the control, uh, does CCTV perform any of uh, the so-called fourth estate type check and balance or check on power at all in China? And, and how has CCTV fared? Yes, CCTV does try to practice a kind of a watchdog function to a certain degree that's permissible uh, via its own brand of investigative programs. And some of you might know that CCTV has three renowned investigative programs. One is uh, called uh, Oriental Pro uh, Horizon, which is a current affairs program uh, debuted in 1993. Gosh, 20 years ago. Wow. I still remember, you know, when it first came uh, to air, I was actually, you know, I was alert to about this program. I was excited. Uh, time this fly. And then, so what this program did was to actually, the, for the first time in history, uh, to, you know, to put audiences, to document the real lives of, of ordinary folks. Right, so, so it, it endeared itself to audiences by documenting the real lives of ordinary people instead of re broadcasting a party's uh, members' whereabouts and their conferences, their meetings, and so on and so forth. And then a year later, Focus came out, which emphasized kind of investigative, edgy, expose stories. And at its heyday, Focus ranked second only to the National News Bulletin in its rating. National News Bulletin was the 7 o'clock news, prime prime news, which was mandatory for all stations. So, of course, it has high rating, right? And, uh, and I, I actually, when I was in China, I did watch it. And I remembered uh, uh, before my father left, and he also diligently watched it, just wanted to know what's going on. And it, sometimes it's fun, you know, very, okay, so know who is who, where they are, and so on. Um, and then... And focuses ex exposure of corruption-related program, uh, problems, uh, uh, problems, issues touched a raw nerve among China's uh, uh, many level of governments, uh, including the China's uh, new, uh, newly merged plutocrats. And focus was this restricted to two critical reports a week. So quota was was given, right, to say you cannot do more than two. So it's two critical reports a week at most. And imagine that. The, you know, the U.S. regulators tell the, the broadcaster companies you only do two critical uh, reports a week. The White House might be very happy here. Uh, and, and, was, and was also ordered to exercise greater caution in topic selection and in the timing and intensity of the criticism. Okay, so keep a balance, timing and criticism. Certain times you should not criticize. At other times you could. For instance, you know, during the, you know, the major leadership transition, no criticism at all. Right. So um, it's kind of fun. It's like comedy, you know, you know, playing journalism in China is like comedy. Uh, another news magazine program, News Probe, was launched in 1996, uh, explicitly, it, which was explicitly designed to be China's 60 Minutes. Now, here's a very interesting anecdote here. Uh, Sun Yusheng, who is in charge of uh, the news division in China, it used to be and now continues to be the, the guy who is mining the news division, uh, uh, first encountered 60 Minutes in uh, 1993, 20 years ago, and uh, was very limited understanding of the program accountant uh, because of the language barrier, right? So he got hold of this tape. It's a very interesting story. It's 60 minutes, but he had no clue what he was talking about because he un didn't understand the English. And he was finally able to comprehend the program in its entirety when, in 1994, he had his hands on a subtitled episode. I think it's from Hong Kong, right? And about a car insurance scandal. Just imagine 60 minutes doing kind of very surgical a kind of objective uh, investigation about a car insurance scandal. Uh, and then Sun was engrossed. He, he was very much intrigued by the kind of investigative style approach of the program and thought it, you know, it was more suspenseful than fictional TV. So he got hooked. He said, okay, well, why don't we do that? Uh, and he was in a powerful position to do it. So, so two years later, he had an opportunity to come up with his own investigative program. And that gave the birth to News Probe. 
uh, which differed from Focus's more edgy approach, and, and, and it aimed to report stories with depth and subjectivity, supposedly, you know, objectivity, that's what 60 Minutes do. Right. Um, now, the, the kind of a muck rake, uh, raking watchdog style journalism captured the imagination of a new generation of Chinese journalists in the 1990s. It was a very exciting time. And I, I remember that too, uh, during my uh, real visit back to China. I, I remember that kind of uh, you know, enthusiasm among uh, my fellow uh, uh, media practitioners in China. But as these shows started to aggressively doing crime-related corruption stories, it ran into obstacles at multiple levels, local and, 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 and top levels. And local establishments uh, very much balked, and, and News Probe had to really step back, and, and News Probe relented. And so, um, and News Probe was criticized uh, in the last few years uh, for you know, adopting a softer approach. And interesting enough, Zhang Jie, who is the executive producer of uh, News Probe, uh, came to its defense. It defended its kind of uh, uh, more subdued, tempered approach. He told me that the programmer was making a transition from expose to enlightenment, fulfilling Chinese journalists' responsibility of properly guiding public opinions and government functioning. So that's his uh, kind of rationale. Now, Chinese journalists were conceived uh, historically as enlightenment intellectuals that bring uh, information and ideas to the public in order to supervise and mobilize public opinion and also to ultimately influence uh, a government policy. Uh, so, so Chinese journalists were supposed to be independent intellectuals beholden to their cultural aspirations, but not to any political directives, certainly not to market directions. So in this regard, a CCTV is to appease the party and the market it is hardly a model of journalism as enlightened intellectuals who aim to educate both the mass and the government. So the constraint is, you know, continues to be there. Um, and, uh, and the state justified its continued uh, control uh, and was, you know, you know, by preaching this, this notion of equilibrium, equilibrium, right? Criticism is not to provoke discontent, but to promote unity. Right. Order and a, funda a fundamental faith in the national project. Thus, you have this harmonious societies. Right now, you have China Dream. Right. So, uh, regardless, uh, CCTV did uh, made headline news uh, in 2008 by uh, its you know a fabulous reporting on the Sichuan uh, earthquake. So disaster reporting on earthquake in, back in 2008 became a watershed moment for CCTV. So what happened in 2008? How many of you were in China back then in 2008? Wow, during the period. So, so you remember you know, the, the, you know, many things still going on. Now several things contribute to CCTV's swift action. Right? Uh, disaster uh, reporting, as we know, had gradually become less of a taboo since the 1990s with the rapid flow of information across the national border. And there's no way, of course, you can block information flow, flowing in and, and out these days. It's very difficult, right? And the SARS cover-up of uh, 10 years ago, 2003, for instance, turned the citizens away from the state-run media as they were desperately, desperately looking for information. They had no choice other than branching out, looking for information elsewhere uh, from uh, overseas news resources. So the Chinese state came to the realization that too much information management or censorship uh, could turn a natural disaster into a credibility crisis, right? And, and secondly, the period leading to the 2008 Beijing Olympics uh, with Western media blasting at China for the Tibet issue, the issues of human rights abuse, and the tinted infant formula scandal, if you recall back then. And this is, has been a, a PR nightmare for the Chinese state and Australian media. Right? So, so changes were imminent in the Chinese media and the siege were going, uh, were, were, you know, trying to mount a, a counter narrative about China. And also CCTV was mindful of the competition from the instant online news circulation and from a local station as well. So the network has struggled to be uh, a reputable and respectable source information. Now, what further contributed to CCTV's very swift and frank reporting was the very fact that the Chinese state was so shocked by the quake 
that it failed to issue immediate directives. So the for, you know, for the initial few hours, there's no directives, which provided a very precious window of opportunity for the journalists to act on, for once, their professional instinct. Right? And they acted on it. And uh, so when, but, but, but once it recovered from its initial disorientation hours after the, uh, the, the quake, the propaganda department issued an order barring news organizations other than CCTV and Xinhua news agencies from sending reporters to the disaster zone, requesting them to use only information released by the two state-sanctioned news uh, agencies. And this also contributed to CCTV's popularity. Uh, this kind of CCTV again has the monopoly over airwave. So, right? so thus, for the next three to four hours, CCTV faced a little competition, and its news crews uh, acted really freely according to their professional instincts. Let's talk about very briefly the impact of these reportings. So here's the number. So we have 1.03 people turned to CCTV's quake coverage uh, in a week, during the week, uh, you know, after the earthquake. And Western media outlets themselves, too, made extensive use of Chinese reporting CCTV footage. And in its initial stage, uh, faced open and free coverage on CCTV looked much like the usual coverage on Western media. Uh, it was a redemptive moment for the network, long suffering from delusion and distrust. It has demonstrated that when free to follow their professional instincts, the Chinese professionals, media professionals are ready and able to work to international standards. I think that's significant to, to know that. And then for a moment, the Chinese media appeared to have broken free of their propaganda and mandate. Yet the euphoria proved to be short-lived. Um, uh, I think a, a week into the, uh, the reporting, the propaganda chief Li Changchen paid CCTV a visit, praising, uh, praising its news uh, team for its positive coverage. And on the night of Li's visit, the National News Bulletin added a new segment because, you know, the positive is good. So the new segment is called Heroes in a Disaster. So the free-flowing, uh, broad-ranging, clear, uh, early coverage was changed to very elaborate stories about heroes and achievement of uh, official disaster relief efforts. And, and next month, the following month, Li visited reporters in the earthquake zone to encourage this focus and CCTV's uh, you know, kind of uh, easily reverted to its customary mouthpiece mode. Um, and then, of course, we talk about the CCTV cover uh, report on school building collapse. Right? And did, how did CCTV do that? Well, accounts of the death of thousands of people, uh, school children, as a result of shoddy school construction went viral on the internet, but appeared nowhere on CCTV. Though mentioning school building collapse, CCTV avoided covering the topic from the angle of corruption. Right. Uh, and thus, images of theft and anger, internet complaints and appeals for punitive uh, measures were very carefully filtered out in CCTV's reporting. And, but News Proba did do a program about collapse of school building, but it was shelved. It wasn't allowed to, to get onto the, to the air. Well, despite its muted uh, coverage on school building collapses, CCTV's earthquake reporting did help to repair its own image. And instead of bringing in uh, instability and turmoil, the kind of relative free coverage of the earthquake promoted national cohesion and international praise. Policies supporting the people's right to know benefited the state actually in the end by projecting the image of a respectable press and a responsible state to the international community and by giving the state a more credible voice uh, with which to guide the public opinion. So this actually has a very positive impact uh, only, I, I, you know, I, I hope the, you know, the, 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 the party leader actually took serious note on that. And there's soft power camping. Uh, now, I wanted to touch upon very briefly about uh, what I consider the, the, the relationship between CCTV and the, the so-called China model. And, and I argue in my book that uh, a CCTV is a consummate specimen of a China model. What do we mean by it? So what, what is China model to begin with? Um, a China model refers to the kind of Chinese style state capitalism where a market economy meets strict authoritarian state control that discourages 
any ideas, institutions that might destabilize the political and economic uh, establishments, uh, which is, of course, uh, you know, continues to be the one-party rule, or more specifically, uh, the, the rule of the winners in a party, right? It's, it's interesting, it, since the book came out, uh, I've, uh, you know, people have come to me for all kinds of questions. The, the one question that came up repeatedly was, was this question now, uh, with this fierce competition in, in a global media scape, uh, are people tempted by the kind of financial muscle of a state-backed media? Um, uh, my people wonder if the price of state control is not too high to pay for survival. Uh, so, so which leads to this question of the viability, viability of the China model or the CCTV model. Right? Um, now, what is this, what's the, what's the difference between CCTV and the Western media models, for those of you who study US broadcasting system, what's the difference between in terms of control uh, operation? What's the difference between CCTV, let's say CNN, ABC, or CBS? And then what's the difference between uh, CCTV and the BBC? Can somebody tell me that? Who funds the US? network broadcasters who fund CNN. Okay, so, so is there a, a you know, government control, government funding there? What about BBC? So in theory, BBC is a public television, right? Because it is publicly funded, right? So people often confuse, we talk about uh, CCTV, it often confuse CCTV with public television, but it's not a public television because it's a commercial operation. It's not supported by the state, not supported by license fee, not supported by the taxpayer's money. It is a, a, a commercial entity. Uh, yet, part of the uh, you know, branches of CCTV, especially, especially CCTV the international branches, are actually funded by, backed by a uh, big financial muscle of Chinese state. And that will lead to us to talk about uh, very quickly on CCTV international expansion. But, but let's dwell on this question. So is, is the price too, you know, okay to pay in order to maintain uh, commercial age, uh, edge and financial ability, uh, competition, uh, competitive ability that, that it's okay to lose some kind of control, is it? Well, the, um, so, so the key to understand the media model in China is to, to be mindful of the fact that, that news media in China uh, does not entirely operate as independent and enterprise, right? CCTV is not uh, CNN, ABC, CBS, or, uh, or NBC, uh, nor is it BBC, right? Uh, Xinhua News Agency is obviously uh, not uh, AP, Associate Press, right? Um, the state protection comes with very, uh, you know, strings attached at the expense, really, of free freedom of information and expression. Um, and obviously, the US people would say, OK, well, the US and UK broadcasting networks and the AP are not completely uh, free, as they, too, need to respond to a different kind of pressure, mostly market pressure, but also political and ideological pressure, as in the case of the US PBS's reluctance in broadcasting certain programs that might offend big donors. You know, if you recall, New, York, New Yorkers did a story, you know about certain PBS program, a certain donor, right? Uh, because of that, there's a self, uh, you know, a certain amount of self-censorship self involved as well. It, you know, it, it's right, you know, patronage does buy influence, be it party or money, China or the US, but the extent and the degree of control is different. They're not really the same thing here. And then also I doubt that the Chinese state capitalism model has met increased global approval, even though people are marveling at, oh, this kind of economic miracle, right? And a recent internal uh, party circular asked the Chinese media and universities to avoid seven topics, right? What are the seven topics? Universal values, press freedom, the civil society, citizens' rights, the party's historical uh, aberrations, the plutocrats, and judicial independence. Now, unless the world sees the merit of making do without press freedom, without civil liberties, 
judicial independence, which are integral part of successful market economic practices in varying degrees in the West. And I really don't see the world racist embrace China's model, which is to say the CCTV model to a certain extent. Do I have more time? I yes. lost. Okay, good, good. Now I wanted to briefly touch upon the, the, you know, the China's Chinese television cultural war uh, and and how culture is supposed to function as a as a, a enlightener, right? Now China has time and again launched cultural wars against vulgarity and cultural degradation, seen as the result of Western cultural pollution. And therefore, you have a ban on racy entertainment shows at various the time during the uh, uh, TV's history. Um, now, to be fair, in China, culture is to enlighten rather than entertain. Uh, culture is to guard the purity and quality of Chinese, uh, you know, Chinese tradition, right? Chinese traditional value. Now, the subservience of culture and now media to politics is not entirely the invention of the Chinese Communist Party. It is rooted in a larger tradition of Chinese aesthetics that defines uh, art or information as the good and the beautiful, right? So such a cultural tradition puts greater emphasis on the responsibility of art in the normalization of society, you know, however you wanted to interpret the word normalization, right? And as opposed to Western tradition of art as, as this critical avant-garde, right? It's supposed to push boundaries. And in China, art culture, uh, media, of course, is supposed to teach moral lessons instead of pushing uh, cultural artistic boundaries. So therefore, uh, or expanding markets. So, so therefore, you have this kind of a, a crash here. And now, in November, it's two years ago, in November 2011, uh, the new CCTV president descended onto the network, just as China was launching a, a renewed uh, culture war against the West. And the effort is equated with guarding China's cultural security. That's a serious issue, cultural security. And the Chinese state is frequently on the outlook or the lookout for signs of Western cultural erosion. It's always the West that brings evil right, devices. Right? And, and of course, CCTV is charged with carrying the torch of Chinese high culture and, and mounting the cultural war against the West. And that leads to my, my last point. You know, this is, it has to do international expansion and soft power. And CCTV has come uh, here. Um, the international expansion uh, of CCTV. CCTV has come a long way from an uh, inward-looking party drudgery to a more uh, to a modern media empire seeking international influence and recognition. The clumsy propaganda effort gradually evolved into a more sophisticated PR campaign to repair the country's tarnished international image, which remains for the most part and most of the uh, places uh, negative. CCTV uh, launched in 1986. Uh, CCTV launched in, back in 1986 its first English language uh, program, English News, uh, a daily 15 minutes news bulletin translated from the Chinese news the night before uh, with exclusively domestic coverage. So the international coverage did not come until in the, uh, in the 1990s. And the idea of reaching out to overseas audiences did not take hold until the 1990s. So it's a relatively actually a new phenomenon for CCTV to reach out uh, across the national boundary. And CCTV launched its official English channel uh, in 2000. And then a year after, uh, SAFT officially launched a going out project. That is what's so-called soft power uh, campaign, a going out project to export China's media overseas. And a specific going out strategy is including a broadcasting CCTV4, the Chinese language international channel, and then CCTV9, the English language international channel in important regions around the world. And CCTV International rapidly expanded its foreign language services in the next few years, adding Spanish, French, Russian, uh, Arabic, and, and African and channels to its cocktail of foreign language services that continue to expand right, very aggressively. And then the party's propaganda chief urged CCTV International to become China's CNN in its global reach and, and influence and to forcefully project uh, a Chinese perspective on uh, global issues. And as the former, uh, the, the, you know, the recently departed president of China uh, put it, 
the overall strength of Chinese culture and its international influence is not commensurate with China's international status. So, so it's important to really uh, export Chinese culture, right? So maybe there will be a quota later on in terms of you know what kind of you know how many Chinese culture can be uh, imported here. Uh, so the last point, really the last one. Uh, now, speaking of uh, soft power camping, and uh, that we have to talk about very briefly about CCP America. Now, generating credibility is at the roots of public diplomacy efforts in China's peaceful rise. Uh, is contingent on its ability to effectively target and influence audiences uh, in the U.S. and abroad, right? And the Chinese government allocated 8.7 <coughs> billion, think about this amount of money, in 2009 to 2010 alone to external publicity work. You know, ouch, think about, uh, I think, uh, I believe Hillary Clinton made a, a speech about, so where is the budget here for the U.S. to, you know, uh, to, to project its, uh, you know, its power differently, not just the military power, right? And, and the beneficiaries of this, this, this largest are mostly, of course, for the big four state-owned media corporations, including CCTV, which promptly launched its U.S. outpost, CCTV America, which is you know, only a few miles away from the White House, right under your nose, right? And uh, broadcasting for four hours a day, CCTV America, uh, it's very sleek production quality and fast-paced story narrative and a seasoned American, American reporters makes CCTV America uh, look no different in style than any major international media outlets, including CNN, right, which CCTV aspired to emulate. And CCTV America's vast financial resources, now speaking of the kind of resources only the state can amass. The vast financial resources has brought it veteran news people from the US, UK, and Australia. And among the notable, uh, notable peoples aboard the CCTV America ship are ex Bromberg television anchor Philip Ying, former 60 Minutes producer Barbara Dury, and the Havana based veteran BBC uh, correspondent Michael Vaz. And also, of course, you know, the, the veteran Asia journalist uh, Jim Lurie is an executive consultant for CCTV America. Just think about what money can buy here. And in practice, though, CCTV America is highly ske skewed towards reporting economic and financial news. CCTV America is to bring the voice of China, right, to the American people and to project a positive of image that has been tarnished by this perceived uh, smear campaigns against China from West, uh, mainstream Western uh, media, right? Yet. When it comes to news about China, can, can CCTV America do something? No. The Chinese state broadcast, broadcast American outpost, American branch is tight-lipped, shows little incentive to woo viewers with new revelations. Never mind that, you know, the potential, uh, uh, you know, scandalous Bo uh, Xilai uh, uh, story. Think about if, you know, the, the story Gosh, I just imagine you know Hollywood be fighting for auctioning the story, right? Think about if it's a U.S. broadcasting. There's a political figure in the U.S. with with this kind of scandal. Just think about it. There will be 24 hours nonstop, but CCTV America is not allowed to do it. So, uh, so it is far short of providing compelling alternative narratives. CCTV America has yet to be taken seriously as a credible news sources about China. You know, it purports to re represent China, but but nobody goes to CCTV America to get news about China. They might go to China Post to get China news. <laughs> right? So um, I think I have to wrap it up. Um, so, so you know, ultimately, you know, my book was trying to, to capture this kind of inherent uh, tensions between commerce and politics, entertainment and edification, information and propaganda functions of the Chinese state television. Uh, and, and, you know, and of course the story of China Central Television is, is ongoing. It's, it's non-stop, it continues to evolve. And I, I'm learning new things as I go along every day. So, so that concludes my talk. <laughs>